in their relationships for about eight years. Um, they were mostly white. Um, on average, they made about fifty to fifty-five thousand um, dollars. Most couples were dual earner. Three months post placement, all but two of them were um, parenting children whose adoptions had not yet been legally fi finalized. So, in other words, only two of them were actually the legal adoptive parents of their children. The children were roughly um, half boys, half girls. Um, on average, they were placed around four and a half, but as you can see, there's a very wide, wide age range. Um, 20 of the couples were placed with newborns or toddlers, um, in 16 with school-aged children, and five with teenagers. About half of them were white and half of them were of color. And the reasons for child placement in state custody varied, but um, most parents named multiple reasons. So in 40% of cases, it was because of drug use by the birth parents. In 35% of the cases, abuse or neglect, uh, birth parent mental illness, um, poverty, domestic violence, homelessness, and incarceration were other um, issues that were mentioned. 40% of these children had one prior placement, 35% had between two to four, 15% had between 5 to 10, and 10% had between 11 to 30. Um, it's also important to note that three of these 42 placements did disrupt. Um, two of those were lesbian couples, and one was a gay male couple. Okay, so in terms of the findings, um, the challenges that parents emphasized as um, kind of stressful, were very consistent with the general literature on the transition of parenthood, but were very much uniquely shaped by their experiences as foster to adopt parents. Um, so this is very consistent with the general literature. Uh, many of these parents perceive the loss of time alone with their partner, um, sort of, you know, as a twosome, um, is very stressful to the relationship. Um, this was observed across different couple types. As an example, um, Trina was a lesbian mom of an infant, these are all pseudonyms of course, um, said, everything we do now, we take him with us. We don't spend the same kind of quality time together. We'll be like, I miss you. Um, Anyone who's a parent knows what that feels like. Uh, related to this, some of the participants felt like their partner's attention had really shifted from um, them, so them being kind of the apple of their partner's eye, to the child. And that was really disruptive and sensitive and was a source of conflict for some of them, um, particularly those who kind of couldn't see that this was a short-term kind of adjustment period. Um, as an example, Rebecca, who was a lesbian mom of an infant, said, it got to the point where Linda said, I feel like our relationship is falling apart. I felt shocked. She said, I just need you to pay attention to me. Right now, Emmy is just a baby, so I understand that this is just how it is right now. And Linda didn't trust that. Um, so these were themes that were, again, prominent across couples of all types. Um, now, what's interesting is that a lot of these uh, participants were talk talked a lot about how they were looking forward to kind of getting out, restoring some of that really needed couple time, date nights, and so on. But of course, as foster to adopt parents, they ran into some <laughs> unique barriers in securing that time. So in some, some cases, they lived in states where um, anyone who cared for their child, any babysitter, had to be Cori checked, they had to be over a certain age. So these kinds of requirements meant that it was really hard to kind of get out for a spontaneous night out. Um, and most of them um, couldn't kind of easily find people that, that met this requirement. So what it meant was that a lot of them ultimately weren't really getting out for much time alone. Um, and kind of ironically, the parents with children who had the most kind of extreme difficulties, who were prone to violent outbursts, for example, they were the least likely to be able to find anyone who was either equipped or willing to care for their children, which meant that the people who were the most stressed out, the couples that were under the most strain, were actually the least likely to get any time away from their children, um, who were often teenagers. Um, some of the parents talked about how um, unequal attachment between parent and child was a significant stressor. So in some cases, the child was simply more attached, more bonded to one parent, um, tended to seek that parent out for nurturance, any kind of need, etc. Um, and not so much common stressor among parents of teens. Um, so this is a quote by uh, Walter, who's a heterosexual dad, who said, Jenny knows I'm all permissive. So sometimes she comes to me with something she knows Daphne wouldn't allow her to do. That is one of the biggest shockers, that she was splitting us. And so Daphne says this. She says, she'd come to me and I would say no. And then he'd give in to her and then I'd get angry. And that couple did eventually split up which is kind of interesting. Um, so in some of these cases, um, the difference was so significant that they really could not parent effectively. 
So on the other hand, there's Esther, um, who's a heterosexual mom of a school-aged child, who said, we've had some pretty nasty arguments. And then one of us will say, hey, wait a minute, she's doing this splitting thing quite well. Let's take a breather and talk about it. So in some cases, kind of this mutual recognition that the child was splitting the parents, and with a sense of humor too, was really important in helping the couple to kind of maintain intimacy, to actually view the child um, as engaging in a behavior that was, was um, separating the two parents and keeping them from working effectively as a team. Um, for some couples, uh, differences between partners and their willingness to bond with a child in the absence of legal security was a stressor. So when one partner was seen as more willing and more able to bond with the child and the other partner was seen as kind of holding back, um, that created some tension. Um, now, the key thing here is that the partner who was holding back was typically doing so because they were very afraid of becoming attached to a child that would ultimately be removed from their home. So when couples were able to recognize that and recognize that it's not just that this person's holding back, it's that they're holding back for fear that you know, they're going to become too attached. That was very important for the couple. It wasn't that they didn't care, it was that they did care. Um, Jorge was a gay father of a school-aged child who said, the only sort of conflict that we had was, Eric was way more cautious than I was. He would warn me, he would say, Jorge, you're getting too invested in it. You're putting too much into it. You're not protecting yourself in any way. And that would make me sort of angry. I was like, we have to put ourselves into it. We have to connect to Mikey. So again, this was a couple that ultimately was able to dialogue effectively and maintain intimacy because they were able to recognize that both partners actually really did care for this child. They just had different ways of handling it. And finally, for a few couples, um, being placed with a child essentially made one partner realize how much they wanted to be a parent and made the other partner realize how much they did not want to be a parent. Um, and that was, as you can imagine, very, um, it was a profoundly, uh, um, important and difficult moment when they had to kind of come to terms with this. So in one case that couple split up, in one case the placement disrupted, and in another case the couple did continue to parent that child um, with one partner taking on more of a secondary parenting role. So some of the couples in our study did use different supports, therapy and support groups. Um, so about a third of them said that their child was in child therapy, third was in family therapy, about a fifth was in individual therapy, and a few couples were in couples therapy, with about a third of the sample in adoption-related or LGBT-oriented support groups. Um, these support groups and therapy really helped to normalize understanding and gain support around, around their experiences as foster to adopt parents. Um, it allowed them to um, share information with other adoptive parents, foster to adopt parents, and gain information, for example, about who are the adoption savvy and sensitive psychiatrists, pediatricians, um, social workers, and so on, occupational therapists in the area. Um, it was also a place to draw support around specific aspects of their experience, parenting a child across um, racial lines, for example, or parenting a child with sensory processing issues. Um, what we saw was that um, for same-sex couples, therapy was especially helpful in terms of supporting um, their child's emerging understanding of what it meant to be placed with a same-sex couple. So there's one very memorable example of a gay uh, male couple who talked about how their child's therapist they were in family therapy and their child was, was seeing a child a therapist, was able to help their child to understand that being placed with two dads was not necessarily equivalent to double discipline. So the child was very anxious about being placed with two men because they associated men with physical <laughs> discipline and thought two dads meant two belts. And so the therapist really was helpful in kind of reconfiguring their understanding of what it means to have two dads um, and help them to help this child to get to a healthy place um, with that family where they could understand that they were in a place where they were loved um, and would be taken care of. So just a couple of quick conclusions. Um, based on the study, we see that the transition to parenthood for foster to adopters is really complicated by a variety of factors, including the legal insecurity of the placement, the reasons why the child was placed in foster care, um, and so on. But we also see that therapy and support groups, maintaining good communication and a sense of humor can help couples to manage the difficulties um, that come with parenting a child who's not one's own, um, as well as the associated issues with bonding. So I will end there. I'm trying to keep really good on time so we have plenty of time for questions. Um, and I will introduce our next presenter.
which is April Moyer, and who will put her yes. in this class right then. Thank you, Abby. Yeah. Just give me one second. Despite being early, we're not ready yet. <laughs> This is what I wanted to do this earlier, sorry. Okay. Have a few folders on here. Okay. Okay. Alright. Excellent. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for coming. As Abby said, my name is April. I work with her. Um, at Clark University. I'm a doctoral student there in clinical psychology. Um, so what I'll be talking about today is data that come from the same study that Abby had talked about, so the Transition to Adoptive Parenthood Project. Um, the focus of my talk though is a little bit different even though it's also related to child welfare adoption as well as LGBT um, parenting. So the title is You Don't Get Everything. It's a partial quote from one of our parents, the foster to adoptive parents' child preferences across the transition to parenthood. Okay, so as Abby mentioned, um, the transition to parenthood is stressful for any parent. Um, it's especially stressful for adoptive parents. And when parents adopt from foster care, they have some unique kind of stressors. So they have to go through a process that's a, bit, a little bit more in depth um, than parents who adopt from private agencies. They have to go through training, parent training courses. They have to be CPR certified. They have to have first aid certification. They have to keep these things um, up to date until the child is officially adopted. They also go through a home study, which most adoptive parents have to go through. Um, in addition, as Abby had mentioned as well, the children who are in foster care and who are available to be adopted or ready for adoption come with um, some challenges that not all kids who are being adopted come with. So they have higher rates of health difficulties, attachment issues, um, ADHD, you can see kind of a list there of different challenges that come along with a child who has had foster care history, which you guys have heard about kind of all day long. So just as a reminder, Transition to parenthood is stressful for everybody. Transition, transition excuse me, to adoptive parent is a little more stressful sometimes, and then when you consider child welfare adoption, it kind of exacerbates the stress for some families. Um, and then when you add on a same-sex couple, there are some additional stressors that are to be taken into consideration. So they face potential discrimination from adoption agencies, they face potential discrimination from individual social workers, um, and kind of along the way have to navigate that possible discrimination. Um, the other kind of part of this whole foster to adopt process is that parents are asked what their preferences are for the children that they intend to adopt or the children that they want to welcome into their home. And um, same-sex parents may receive, and research has shown that sometimes they do receive, the message that they should be more open to the children who are more difficult because they're seen as less desirable parents um, than heterosexual par parents, for example. And that maybe they should put some of their preferences to the side if they actually want to eventually adopt or to expedite the process. So it's another kind of layer of um, stress that might be happening for families who are adopting from foster care, especially, like I said, if they're in a same-sex uh, relationship. Okay, so just kind of an overview of um, some realities and some preferences that have been kind of shown in the literature. Um, as was mentioned earlier today, there are over 100,000 children in the U.S. waiting to be adopted in the foster care system. So that's not just children in foster care. Those are children whose parental rights have been terminated. Um, the parents' preferences are typically the ones that I've listed up here on the slide. So as 
potential parents are asked um, by social workers kind of what what do you hope for in your family what do you see for your future what um, do you have specific preferences for the children most often the case is that they have the preference that their child matches their race um, that they're young right children under the age of three um, and oftentimes they specify like we can handle I've heard lots of these interviews and um, have talked to many parents as well say so we can handle a little bit of special needs but anything too severe we can't handle so that's kind of um, where the typical foster to adoptive parent lies certainly not every parent certainly there are parents out there who have very different preferences from the get-go but this is kind of on average this is what people expect or prefer um, is this the reality of kids in foster care are most of them under three? No, right? So that's the reality. So most, as Abby mentioned too, um, most kids in foster care are not under the age of three. The average age is eight. Um, and 48% of them are of minority race or ethnicity, and that certainly doesn't match the potential pool of parents who are adopting from, from foster care. So the realities and preferences often don't match, which is what I'll be talking about. So what happens with this mismatch? And is it that much of a stressor? How do parents kind of get over the fact that not maybe not all of their preferences um, that they had originally specified will be matched later on? Okay, so that's what this study is all about. I'm examining adoptive parents' unmet expectations and how they adjust and cope during that transition to adoptive parenthood. Um, here are the questions that we focused on. Uh, I wanted to know if there are certain types of unmet expectations that are more stressful than others. So, for example, um, if a couple goes in saying, you know, we have a really specific age range that we're looking at, and then a child gets placed with them who does not meet that age range, is that more stressful um, than a child who doesn't meet, meet a race expectation, for example, or a gender expectation? The couple really wants a little girl and instead they're placed with a boy, how much does that matter and how do parents kind of cope with that difference? Um, same thing with race as well as special needs. So if a couple says, kind of what I was saying before, if we can handle some special needs, um, not very severe special needs or maybe not severe medical special needs, and then a child gets placed into their home who turns out to have more severe needs than they anticipated, how does a couple kind of cope with that? So. It's one of the um, main research questions that I have. And then how do adop adoption type and sexual orientation shape their experiences of or reactions to these unexpected characteristics? So does it matter that they're adopting from the child welfare system? Does it matter that they're a heterosexual or a same-sex couple um, when thinking about these unmet expectations? Okay, so the interviews are the same interviews that I was talking about. I'm just looking at some of the different questions that we've asked. We ask many, many questions. Um, the ones I focused on were the ones that are that you can see up here. What problems or surprises did you encounter with the adoption process? How prepared did you feel for the adoption? Um, I asked about the demographic characteristics of the children and then asked them if that, that was different from what they had initially expected. Um, and if it was different, was it a negative experience, a positive experience, mixed, neutral, and ask them to explain or elaborate on, on that experience. Okay, so I'm just gonna briefly describe the sample. It's um, very similar, though not exactly the same as what Abby described. Um, 90 indivi individuals, 30 gay men, 30 lesbians, um, and also 30 heterosexual couples. Um, their average age was about 38, mostly white. Um, their median salary as a family was 120000 They come from across the United States. Uh, this sample is highly educated, but if um, you've looked much into adoption research, that's the tendency. Um, people who adopt children are, are oftentimes more highly educated than the generic general public. Um, 30, double, 30 couples adopted from foster care and 15 adopted privately. So I wanted to get some experiences too of couples who had adopted um, domestic with through private agencies just to see if there was anything that seemed um, drastically different or similar. The kids of these parents uh, ranged in age from newborn to 15 years old. 
Uh, as you can see, the median age is four. All of the parents who adopted privately adopted newborns. So this um, is really showing you the range of uh, people who adopted from foster care. For the racially, racial diversity was 57% white. Um, so that's in terms of the children. Okay, so what did we find? So this table shows you just um, the numbers of what the unmet expectations were, um, broken down by adoption type and sexual orientation. As you can see, if you look on the bottom row, um, most couples endorse some kind of unmet expectation, which is probably not too surprising, right? No one really ever gets the exact type of child that they, that they were hoping for um, from the beginning. But there are a couple of interesting things, I think, to point out. Um, the most common type of unmet expectation described by people who adopted from child welfare um, was either a race or a special needs expectation. And when you, the uh, couples had adopted privately, their most common unmet expectation is gender, right? So to think about kind of what it means to be placed with a child who's a different gender from what you expected compared to a child who's a different race or a child who has a different level of special needs is something to consider, right? Those are very different experiences. Um, in terms of sexual orientation, kind of just on looking at their unmet expectations in general, there weren't really um, huge differences. Some slight differences, but nothing, nothing major yet for this slide. So then if we look at the reactions, um, their, how they felt about the unmet expectations, you see some interesting patterns emerging here as well. So if we go by um, the demographics, if you look at age, so these are the people who said either they expected a younger child or they expected an older child, um, they had a range of reactions to this kind of unmet expectation or this mismatch. Some had considerable stress and some described it as a pleasant surprise. So you can see those people, those five on the far right, those people expected an older child. So these are the types of people, and I'll get into this in a little bit, but these are the families who went into the adoption having very um, adequate and sufficient training ahead of time to let them know that they were likely to get an older child than what they initially expected. So when they were placed with a younger child, it was kind of a pleasant, like, okay, well, that's what I was initially hoping anyway, so that's, that's a nice surprise. Um, whereas some people cons had considerable, considerable stress or manageable stress um, dealing with age. So if you move kind of further down, gender and race had a range as well. However, none of those families actually ex expressed that they were under stress that they really couldn't manage. It was either manageable or really um, not as big of a deal for their family as um, some of these other things were for other families. And then if you look at special needs, uh, those numbers are to the left, right? The, the left part of the table is the more stressful side. So people who were placed with kids with special needs that they weren't anticipating or they weren't expecting or they flat out said they weren't ready for, um, those were the parents that were in, in the most distress. Okay, so to look at some of their more qualitative um, experiences, this is kind of what we found. The two conditions that contributed to stress um, were lack of support and what we call the perceived inability to mold the child. So let me start with the support part. So I put both formal and informal up there. So by formal stress, I, or formal stress, excuse me, formal support, I mean professional people. So therapists, social workers, um, physicians, teachers, those, those kinds of people. And then informal support, I'm talking about family and friends. So a couple who is under a lot of stress um, might have explained that they have this lack of support either from formal sources or informal sources. And this um, mom, Jane, she's a lesbian mom of a child with, she had a child with an anticipated pretty severe special needs, it turned out. She said this, I can't tell you how many workshops and lectures and classes and anything you can think of. We talked to, you know, a bazillion therapists who deal with this. We get it, why she does what she does. What I keep going back to is it's different living with it. And I think a lot of people in this profession don't get that. They haven't lived with them. 
So she's acknowledging that the people in the profession are trying to explain why her daughter or her son or her children act the way that they do because of their traumatic history, because of what they've been through, because of their transitions, because of all of these reasons, but she's feeling unheard because she, that's not exactly what she wants to hear right now, right? She wants to hear someone really listening to her and understanding that her experience is hers and her experience is real and that maybe not everyone understands it, but we can listen and we can help her figure out a way to cope with what she's going through. Um, so then this other um, kind of part of this theme is this perceived inability to mold the child. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. Marcus, a gay father, said about his, um, he actually adopted two kids. He said, I was really hoping for a younger child in order to affect their personality. So oftentimes when a parent is preferring to adopt a younger child, it's because they want to be the person to give their child the memories that the child grows up with, right? The, all the first, the first day of kindergarten, the first loose tooth, the first trip to the doctor, the first, the, any, any kind of big first, right? <laughs> and when a parent is presented with a child who's older than what they initially expected, they might have this kind of sense of loss of realizing that they're not going to be the person who experiences these firsts with these children. Um, so when a parent gets stuck in that kind of mentality, that also contributes to some significant stress, um, especially if they can't kind of move past that and, and deal with that loss. Okay, so how about the people who described a positive adjustment? What helped with them? So this is kind of the opposite of the stressful adjustment, right? It's sufficient support, again, both formal and informal. And then there was this other piece of parents who described a shift in their perspective, so a shift in how they thought about what they were going to be encountering as parents or how they were going to be parenting their child after they realized that the child didn't necessarily meet their initial expectations. So starting with the sufficient support, um, these people mentioned anyone who was in their realm of kind of their life ste really stepping up to the plate, be it their parents, be it their siblings, the teachers at the schools, their physician, their pediatrician, people who were just there for them. And they're in a way that was supportive, right? This isn't rocket science here. Support is always helpful, and, and people definitely describe that when they were transitioning um, to parenthood and, and parenting a child they weren't necessarily expecting. This other piece, the parent shift in perspective, um, I have a quote here from John, who is a heterosexual father, who said, Based on my experience, from two to three on up, you're just dealing with a lot of things I just didn't think we were ready or willing to take on. But, you know, experience has proved me wrong. So he and his uh, wife were placed with a child who was uh, a little older. And as time went on, he realized, you know, we can do this. We, we do have the tools that we need. Um, and we can, we can keep moving forward and have have um, a healthy, happy family. But he was able to shift that perspective rather than the other parent who I talked about in the previous slide who was kind of stuck in this, you know, I really wanted, I really wanted something different. I really wanted to be there, do these things with my child that he or she has already experienced. John, on the other hand, is, is kind of more flexible in his thinking and is able to um, shift his perspective. So that also contributed to positive adjustment. It's a coping mechanism that was um, effective for him and other parents. And then we have kind of this last group of people who described really a neutral adjustment. So they were the people who said, you know, we didn't, we didn't get exactly what we wanted uh, or what we thought we were going to get in terms of our child and their characteristics, but it really wasn't a big deal. Um, we got through it. We didn't need a lot of support. And or we were ready for it. So these people, these parents, described adequate pre-adoptive training. So this is especially relevant, um, obviously, for child welfare adopters to be prepared for what they might encounter when a child is placed with them. Um, and also to be prepared to deal with things that they weren't necessarily expecting. So the parents who described this pre-adoptive training as being adequate um, seem to come out of the training with a more open mind that we don't really know exactly what's going to happen, but we know and have the resources that we need in order to 
um, really move forward and have a, a more stable transition to becoming a family than parents who are, very, who are more rigid or um, just kind of clueless about what to really expect. Um, and then the other piece of this is parents who said our priority was just becoming parents. You know, we had some preferences, but they weren't nearly as important as being placed um, or has, having a child placed in our care. Um, so I have a quote from Mandy, who's a lesbian mom. She said, you know, that, which she was referring to their preference um, for gender for their child, was so secondary to having a baby. Um, interestingly, this group of parents was mostly in same-sex relationships. So the people who had tended to say their priority was parenthood and not really what they preferred, this is what I was referring to at the very beginning of parents possibly feeling like they need to be more open in order to be placed, have a child placed in their home um, from the beginning, especially if they're seen as less desirable parents or maybe not um, as desirable. The other flip side of this is that they really are just more open, right? It's not necessarily the case that they're hiding their preferences or holding them back. It may, it may just be that they don't have um, as strong of preferences or they're more open-minded to different types of children. Okay, so some kind of basic conclusions. Um, is just to kind of think about this phenomenon. Are same-sex couples seen as less desirable um, in terms of agencies, in terms of individual social workers, even if an agency has a policy or seems to be open to all types of families, it doesn't necessarily mean that every person who works there is, right? So are same-sex couples' preferences de-emphasized? Are they feeling like they really shouldn't be too selective or too specific so that they are, um, their process has moved along more quickly than people who seem either less desirable or just being more selective. Um, it's just kind of a something to be aware of, I guess, and to be proactive if you are a person who works in that in that profession that same-sex couples may be feeling that. Um, and it's something to address in case in case it's holding them back from saying what they actually prefer. Um, and then the last part is something you've heard a million times is that the importance of pre and post adoption support cannot be uh, neglected. So remember, remembering that adoption from foster care has these unique challenges um, and that the ability to be flexible can be effective. So when therapists are working with um, parents after they transition to parenthood, after they maybe have realized, you know, this, my child is not who I thought they were going to be, um, the therapists who are working with these parents can try to help them be a little more cognitive, cognitively flexible using techniques like CBT and really working on what they're thinking, their rigid um, thought processes, how that might be holding them back from being more open-minded and being more able to see the strengths that they have as parents that maybe they aren't recognizing. Um, and then the last piece is just that the support that these parents need does not only come from the agencies and social workers, which we talk about over and over and over, but as parents expressed in these interviews and in this study, they need support from everyone who they interact with, right? So they need support from therapists as well, but also their physicians, their pediatricians, um, their teachers, the principals, the school administration, their own family who may not have anticipated that their child was going to be adopting a, a child with severe special needs or a child of a different race or a child um, who they just hadn't expected in the first place. People, everyone in the, these families' networks needs to be kind of aware that they could be a potential support for them, um, especially as we've mentioned several times that the transition to parenthood is so stressful and really children and families interact with so many people that could, that could really impact um, parents' success and families' kind of happiness overall. So that's, thank you. Um, I'll leave it up to take it to continue. Thank you.
on the port. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I want to thank Abby for, you, for organizing this little thing together. Um, my presentation is, is based upon a study that Abby and I just published a few months ago um, in Children and Youth uh, Services uh, Review. So if you want a copy of it, you can contact either one of us and we'll send you a copy of it. Um, as you know, there is a, a great deal of interest and adoption by gay and lesbian individuals. The uh, over the last uh, few last two decades, um, certainly as the numbers of uh, adoptions by gay and lesbians increased, uh, more interest and the ability to adopt uh, has obviously increased as the barriers uh, that previously either prevented or discouraged gays and lesbians from adopting have, have largely been eliminated. Um, uh, there's still obviously resistance, you know, at the individual level. The laws support. Most regulations support, but at the individual level, I think one of you mentioned the, the discrimination at the casework level can still be a, a major barrier. Gary Gates has uh, suggested, based upon uh, census data, that there are about 65,000 ch adopted children who are currently being raised by uh, families headed by uh, LGBT parents, and that same-sex couples are, are at least four times more likely. Uh, to be raising an adopted child than heterosexual couples, something that most individuals, most professionals don't recognize. Um, like all families, those uh, headed by sexual minority adults require thoughtful uh, and sensitive preparation, uh, both at the pre-placement level and at the post-placement level as well. Uh, preparation and support is particularly important for this group of families this, because of the uh, negative stereotypes and misconceptions, the prejudice that they commonly experience in the process of adopting, but also because, as uh, both Abby uh, and uh, April pointed out, uh, there is a propensity for them to adopt from the child welfare system, uh, children who are older at the time of placement, children of color, and children who have developmental and uh, behavioral and mental health problems. So we know that uh, preparation and support you know, leads to greater family success, particularly in these uh, types of adoptions. An area in which there is a need for more uh, preparation and support for all families, including uh, those who are headed by gays and lesbians, is in the area of open adoption, where there is contact between the adoptive and birth families uh, at some level. Uh, it can be direct, face-to-face, -face, or less direct, by telephone, by texting, uh, or at the farther end of contact, but not, you know, where it's, it, there is no direct, uh, no, no no link between them, but only through an intermediary, and that's usually an agency. Most of what we know about open adoption uh, involves private uh, domestic uh, placements. Uh, much less is known about open adoption or contact with birth family and child welfare adoptions or in international adoptions. Uh, the National um, uh, Survey of Adoptive Parents in 2007 indicated that approximately 68% of 
uh, parents who responded in, uh, in private domestic uh, adoptions indicated that they had some contact post-placement with one or more members of uh, the birth family. Uh, the respective figures for uh, child welfare and international adoptions was 39% and 6%, although the latter, I think, is, is way off at this point in time. Um, and, and as you'll see, I think the 39% is, is way off. Uh, little is known about open adoption in families headed by lesbian and gay parents. Um, given the stereotypes and the prejudice they often face, uh, it's really critical, I think, that we know more about the extent of contact and the experiences that they have when contact is made. On the one hand, we could argue that uh, the negative attitudes that they face might result in less contact or less openness uh, or resistance to openness on the part of birth family. But Abby and others have argued that uh, sexual minority adults may approach adoption from a different vantage point uh, than heterosexual adult, adults, which could impact uh, their motivation to seek and maintain contact with birth family. For one thing, there's some research suggesting that, that gays and lesbians have more expansive ideas of kinship. In other words, they're more willing to incorporate into their sense of family individuals who are not biologically related or not living with them per se. Um, there's all, they're also, as they seek to adopt, less likely to be impacted by infertility. That's usually not a motive for adopting, although sometimes it is. Um, and as a result, uh, there may be an impact on their development of an identity as mom or dad. There's less loss involved when, when there is not infertility. Uh, well, some people have argued, and I, I agree then, that you know, there's, if there's less loss, then sometimes there may be uh, less hesitancy you know, to, um, to incorporate uh, the birth family into, the, into their lives and the lives of their family, uh, the lives of their children. Uh, also, uh, both Abby and I in separate studies have found that gay men, uh, this is in private domestic adoptions, gay men are sometimes purposely chosen by birth moms to ensure that they're the only mother in their children's lives. So in that case, almost always there's some contact post-placement, whether it stays open or not is of course, you know, it's highly variable. Um, two studies, before ours, two studies uh, focused on contact uh, between uh, gay and lesbian adoptive families and um, uh, birth families. Uh, these we both were in uh, de dealt with private adoptions, though. Uh, Abby was involved in both of them. Uh, one with her students and one with Rachel Farr. I guess she was your student at one time too. Yes? No? She wasn't. Okay. Uh, I didn't realize that. Uh, they found that uh, gay and lesbian parents had very positive views of open adoption. And in one of the studies that, that they were just as likely, and in some cases even more likely, depending upon the time frame, to, to have contact with birth family, at least through one year post-placement. But up until our study, there were no studies that examined contact experiences in families headed by gay and lesbian parents in child welfare adoption. And of course, that was our motive for, for doing this. Uh, we sought to look at uh, contact uh, between comparing uh, different family types of heterosexual headed families, lesbian headed families, and gay male headed families um, in terms of contact with birth family at three points in time uh, prior to or to time of placement, following placement, and currently in the family's lives. Our data was drawn from the Modern Adoptive Families Project, a, a nationwide but non random survey that I conducted in 2012 to 2013 when I was at the Donaldson Adoption Institute. Um, the, the MAF project was set up to examine similarities and differences between many different kinds of, of adoptive families, but there was a primary focus, or at least one of our primary focus. Uh, so I was, was in dealing with the ex looking at the experiences of uh, uh, gay and lesbian families. So we purposely oversampled uh, when we collected our data. Uh, we have about 1,600 families in the large data set, um, and uh, about 250 of those families are, are headed by gays or lesbians. Um, and if you're interested in looking at that, you know, uh, at the overview of that, uh, there is an article on the Donaldson website. Uh, that describes the, the project in general. For the current sample, um, of those 1,600 and some uh, you know, families, uh, 432 had adopted from the foster care system with children under the age of eight, whose oldest adopted child was currently under the age of 18, and where the parents identified their sexual orientation. There are some who de declined to identify on that survey, uh, but most did. 
Um, so we have 317 families headed, uh, headed by heterosexual parents. 61 families headed by lesbian parents, 54 families headed by gay male parents, all adopted from the child welfare system. The target child was the oldest adopted child in the family. So I'm going to show you some uh, similarities and differences on the respondent demographics. Only one parent per family responded. Um, and I'm going to show you some, some of the demographics of the oldest adopted child. Now there are some differences, but let me jump ahead and say that none of these differences account for the contact differences or the patterns of contact that I'm going to be talking about. So uh, we have some respondent care, uh, differences among family types and some differences among the oldest adopted child, as you'll see. Um, they're not the factors that account for these differences. So our, our respondents are, you know, roughly a 40, on average 42 years to, to 44 years of age. Uh, they're mostly Caucasian, although gay male uh, uh, respondents uh, are less likely to be Caucasian. Uh, gay, uh, as as uh, other research in the area of uh, gay and lesbian adoption has shown, uh, gay and lesbian uh, partners are less likely to be of the same sex. In other words, there's more likely to be interracial partnerships in gay and lesbian adoption than in uh, uh, heterosexual parents. Uh, they were all partnered at approximately the same level and consistent with what we generally find in literature in terms of single uh, adoption versus uh, coupled adoption. As you might expect, uh, heterosexual were more often married. Uh, they were married longer. On the other hand, um, lesbian and gay parents were better educated, and certainly gay men were much more uh, financially secure. And again, that's generally found in the literature when you look at the adoption literature in parenting. Uh, with regard to the oldest adopted child, our average age of child was uh, uh, nine years, ranging from infancy to up to the, you know, the teenage years. Um, <laughs> Uh, most of the children uh, were not Caucasian, and again, that's consistent uh, with uh, the child welfare literature. We find that uh, gay men, uh, and to some extent lesbians, were much less likely to adopt uh, a Caucasian child, uh, more likely, therefore, to be involved in transracial placements. Um, and again, that's consistent with the literature. There's no differences in the age of placement. The average age was between three to four years of age, and the length of time in the family, no differences between five and six years of age. So what did we find? Contact uh, prior to or at the time of placement. There was no family uh, type differences in contact. Uh, heterosexuals slightly higher at 52% had contact, uh, but you know the difference between that and, and the percentage for gays and lesbians were not different. When we get into contact following placement, though, we begin to see differences. On the far left side is the overall <laughs> contact post-placement and gay men were significantly more likely to have contact than either uh, those families headed by lesbians or heterosexual parents. They had more face-to-face -face contact, more contact by telephone, but less likely to have contact uh, only through an intermediary. So their, when they had contact, it was either face-to-face -face or through telephone, through, through email, through social uh, media of some sort. There were no diff family type differences uh, in using uh, email or postal mail or texting or other f social media or other kinds of contact. <coughs> current contact. Again, gay men reported higher levels of current contact compared to lesbian and gay men. Uh, I might add, although I don't have a slide here, there was a tendency for gay men to also report having better current relationships with the birth family. It wasn't quite significant, didn't quite reach the .05 level, but, uh, and I should say that the, the difference was, was between gay men and lesbian-headed families, with the heterosexual families in between. We also looked at those families that were not in contact uh, currently, and we asked, what are your plans? Do you think you'll search for, uh, for, for the birth family? And the most common response was that they just weren't sure, uh, and with no differences uh, in family type in terms of those who were not sure, those who said definitely not, and those who said yes, we, we plan to. So the overall contact rate for child welfare adoptions is higher than has been reported in past research, including uh, the National Survey of Adoptive Parents. On the one hand, it's somewhat surprising because uh, there are a lot of challenges in child welfare adoptions and, and with contact. You know, 
know, these are children who are removed for cause, and, and oftentimes families are very unsure about whether they want to expose themselves to some of the challenges that the birth family have encountered. But remember, well, I didn't point this out, but when I talk about contact, I'm talking about contact with one or more members. It's not necessarily the birth mother or birth father, although the birth mother is the most likely the person to be in contact. Birth grandparents are high up there too. Birth siblings and other placements are high up there. So we're talking about contact with some members of the birth family that might support a sense of connection with their heritage and, and, and birth identity and so forth. Um, oops, let me just jump ahead. It's possible that some of our findings reflect in part um, a sampling bias. We want to acknowledge that. We have a very well-educated and financially secure family, certainly a little bit higher than even uh, that found in the National Survey of Adoptive Parents. But there's also reason to believe that the, there is more contact than, than, than is going on, or at least that most people recognize, let's say, uh, more contact in, in child welfare adoptions. Um, whatever the reason we, you know, for this, you know, we certainly need to prepare child welfare personnel more, train them you know, more for helping families to s establish and, and negotiate the issues in contact. Uh, Contact waxes and wanes over time, as you are aware, and families need help in terms of negotiating some of the challenges. We need more research in this area, uh, not just in terms of the frequency, but who's making contact with whom, who's initiating contact, why does contact sometimes, and what are the barriers for establishing contact, what factors support contact, what factors you know tend to undermine it, and so forth. Um, oops. What accounts for the high level of contact in adoptions by gay men in particular? Uh, but, you know, even lesbians were, were high up there. The bottom line is we simply don't know, but, but certainly there is a desire. We know that from research that gay and lesbian adoptive parents, uh, gay and lesbian parents, period, uh, desire openness and transparency in dealing with sexual um, orientation and sexual identity. There may be some generalization and that transparency, that need for openness, that desire for openness may translate into the desire to be open and honest vis-a-vis -vis the contact with the child's heritage to support that heritage. Uh, the whole issue of, of perhaps greater tolerance for boundary ambiguity in what constitutes family membership is something we have to look into more. And the issue about motives for adopting and whether infertility or other motives that might differentiate gay and lesbian-headed families from heterosexual families may pay, play a role in, in this process. Um, just I'm running out, so I just want to quickly run through this. Obviously, we need to, to, to do much more in terms of, of comprehensive and objective uh, training related to open adoption in general. So many agency folks, when it comes to the issue of open adoption, have a lot of concerns about it, and that message gets translated both to the adopted parents and to birth parents sometimes, and, and we need to help them to understand both the benefits, also the challenges. There are many challenges in, in contact with child welfare adoptions, and no question. We need, we need to educate and prepare the clients, the adoptive parents, and the birth parents around the benefits and challenges of open adoption. And to ensure that professionals, the adoption professionals, explore the receptivity of birth parents uh, and birth relatives, not just the parents, but the birth relatives, regarding placing a child uh, with sexual minority parents. Mm -hmm. And finally, we need to be more aware of some of the unique issues involved in the experiences of gay and lesbian parents, particularly those that um, are having contact or planning contact with birth family. And I want to talk about one particular issue called that has to do with something called narrative burden. And I'm going to relate that first to transracial placement because that's where it's been applied. Uh, and Ava and I believe that it's also uh, applicable here. In the area of transracial adoption, we've come to understand that, um, how questions about race from people both inside the family, extended, you know, extended family, as well as people outside the family, often create stress for adoptive parents and for the children. And questions were, that are intrusive, you know, standing in, in the supermarket with your child of a different race, you know, and someone just has the audacity to start asking questions about where this child came from. Um, Robert Ballard who writes about the narrative burden, 
he writes about it in the context of transracial placements. Abby and I suggest that the same type of narrative burden exists in adoption by sexual minority adults. Sharing of information about sexual identity and sexual orientation with others, including birth family, can create stress for these adults in terms of how that information is used by the others, uh, not only interactions with them, but in interactions with their children, particularly when contact occurs. Once shared with birth parents, <laughs> this information now is co-owned with the other individuals to do with what they want to do with it. And birth parents also have this burden. If a birth parent is supportive of a placement, the question is, how do they deal with this issue with extended family, with people outside, with the community members, when questions are asked, your child is living with whom? Two dads? Two women? And so this is a, an issue that they have to figure out how to deal with in their discussions about their own relationships with their child and the child's birth family, excuse me, the child's adoptive family, in their own family in the community. And this is an area that there's very little about and an area that I think we need to do much more in terms of preparing both the adoptive parents and the birth parents to deal with this so-called narrative burden. And I thank you. And I guess we have a few minutes for questions. questions for you. Um, sure. I was surpri really surprised to see the, how high the numbers were for pre-placement contact. And I was interested to know, particularly in the child welfare system, that's, that's not what I see anything close to that in terms of contact that I, I run both a private program and a public program. So it's kind of on both sides are very open. And so I don't see that kind of open adoption contact that is preparation for an open adoption relationship with biological family. I see that there's some contact, like visiting, like you bring your foster child to the visit at the DCF office, but there's not a sit-down facilitated no, time it, it, for the adoptive parents to get to know the birth parents and build a, an openness that's going to be and, a more workable And openness. contact in this study does not necessarily mean relationship building. Right, well, that's what I was wondering. Yes, what, what exactly. does that contact mean? Well, it, we don't fully know because this is a big survey and it we weren't really able to ask the kinds of narrative questions that perhaps might answer your, your question and, your, and the fact that you don't see it. But as you know, since most adoptions in the foster care system are by foster parents and oftentimes at visits or other situations, they get to meet uh, and they may exchange, uh, they may even know the identity at that point in time. That for them is in some sense contact with it, that they can talk about uh, having met and, and uh, identified and been identified by birth <coughs> families. So I agree with you that that is uh, that would be considered high in terms of, excuse me, relationship building, you know, pre-placement pre or at the time of placement. Because I see there's a huge need in the child welfare side to work on that relationship building piece, and it is not built into, at least in Massachusetts, the, the DCF system of placement. There's not not quite a I don't think it's it. built in anywhere. I mean, yeah. very often the, the, there are, there's a barrier between allowing the, uh, the foster adopt parents and the birth family from getting to know one another, other than brief contact through uh, times of visits. They, they often prevent it from happening. Right. So, and I think that that's a huge mistake. It's a huge area of need. And yeah, my my huge other area. question was just around the, the gay dads and their contact um, uh, being higher post-placement. Um, and I wondered whether there's any piece of that, and of course you probably don't know, um, that's related to wanting to present as um, a successful family. If there's a pressure to pre present as successful, and therefore in that somehow more contact running more successful. As a, way of, yeah, as a way of countering the whole idea yeah. that being a parent is a, is a role for, for women. Yeah, as, yeah I, I think you've raised that with me in our discussions at times. It may well be. I'm going to sit down yeah. Um, so, in situations where um, sexual minority parents do adopt um, race minority children transracially, do you think that sexual minority parents, because of their um, lived experiences with discrimination on that side of their identity, kind of like are more prepared to engage in for bias behaviors with their race minority children? Do you think that generalizes over the two identity components? We have two papers on that very topic <laughs> that were published in the last year. Um, that, yeah, well, so there, my work and some other work shows that um, lesbian and gay couples are more open to adopting transracially. 
they are also more likely to adopt transracially, so actually more likely to complete a placement. And when you act, ask them why they're open, um, a sizable minority of those lesbian and gay parents do cite experiences as minorities themselves um, and exposure to discrimination and a belief that they can themselves prepare a child for stigma in the world um, uniquely because of their own experiences as minorities. On the flip side, some of them will also say, my experience as a lesbian woman means nothing in terms of preparing a child for racial discrimination because those are two entirely different um, experiences. But sort of a, a, a key thread, as you should be seeing it here, is that they're more open. So there's just more openness in general, and that could translate, as we're seeing, to an openness to talk about, for example, racial incidents, racial discrimination, preparation for bias. Um, and we do see some, we do see that lesbian and gay parents are engaging in more of those conversations with their children that as compared to heterosexual parents who have adopted transracially. We're going to be exploring that issue in the math study. We have some racial socialization skills in there. We haven't adequately uh, analyzed it yet to answer the question whether it generalizes yet. But, you know, some quick overview. Vacancies and so before they, before they actually adopted. And yes, that's definitely some of the research that we're experiencing. Like I was saying, the um, sample comes from across the U.S., so it's often dependent on where they live, um, but also where they live in terms of their own social networks and how much, how much support they feel there. So yeah, we do have. And I, if I we have just that. Yeah, I can tell you exactly which ones okay. to look at. Um, and I will just say, just as an aside, that um, it's not just explicit forms of discrimination that they're dealing with, but often there is sort of uncertainty. For example, couples, we've had, we had couples that I remember they said something like, you know, they filed 300, you know, inquiries for children and they were never responded to um, through Adopt Us Kids. And they were like, oh, we don't know what that's about. Like, we think we're being discriminated, but we don't know. So when nobody's calling you back, when nobody's placing a child with you, when you're placed with a child and that child's quickly removed, you don't know why that's happening. And that's a very common experience among our Minority and this has been like post marriage equality in, in the sense uh, states have Well, most of those data come from before, but I don't necessarily think that, like, I, I mean, I think it, there's, a, there's a slow change, but I don't think marriage equality, like, right. made everyone be like, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Those people who are going to discriminate are probably still discriminating. Yeah, it's a difference between the, the le whether it's legal or not, or the regulatory yeah. barriers were being removed versus the experience at the at the one on one level when you right. actually apply face to face with the worker. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll stay up just for a couple minutes in case people want to come talk to us. And I know I said I would give people. Could you just say what your website is? You sure. Um, if, you, if you just Google my name, it's the first thing oh, okay. that comes up. But yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's too long and complicated with a university name. Like that, so. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you.